Welcome to this uh, SSH network webinar series. So this is our first uh, webinar. So an SSH, that's the, the Social Sciences and Humanities Network, uh, which is also related uh, to IFPES. So the webinar series is organized by uh, myself and uh, Maria Stenseke and Marla Emery. Uh, and we're also the organizers of the SSH uh, network. So we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Jasper Montana with us uh, here today. Uh, he's a research fellow in human geography at the University of Oxford. Uh, his research interests encompass science and policy relations, the geographies of science and expertise, and environmental governance. This with a particular focus on exploring these issues for biodiversity. His research draws from and contributes to a broad range of scholarly traditions, including political ecology, science and technology studies, sustainability science, organizational studies, and the interdisciplinary environmental sciences. And Jasper has a rich background in academia, but also beyond. For example, he has five years experience working in natural history documentary production for the BBC and National Geographic. And he has also spent time as an intern at the United Nation, uh, Nations Environment uh, Programme in Germany. So quite an interesting background. Uh, but today we look forward to learn more about his perspectives on the social sciences and humanities in IPES, and, uh, and especially his perspectives on, on thinking um, uh, how we can move beyond inclusion for SSH in IPES. Quite an interesting title, so uh, we look forward to this. Jasper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to present and also to have a conversation afterwards about the social sciences and humanities in IPBES um, and how we might uh, think about that going forward. And I'm really excited that there is now this network that's emerged uh, to support that work. Uh, so my talk today, as mentioned, is, is about moving beyond inclusion for social sciences and humanities um, and drawing on some of the scholarship uh, and experiences that have taken place during the first work program of IFBES to think about how we might move forward. Um, so the structure of the talk, first of all, I'm going to start with a broad overview of why we need social sciences and humanities in global environmental assessments. Uh, next, I'll briefly talk about how inclusion works in IPBES and some critical perspectives that have been offered by scholars about that. Um, and then finally, um, I'm going to put forward an argument about how we might go beyond inclusion to foster what I'm uh, describing as a form of epistemic belonging for social sciences and humanities within IPBES. Um, so uh, we hopefully we all know about IPBES. Um, but just a broad recap for those um, that are new to the platform. Um, IPBES was established in 2012 under the United Nations, under the auspices of the United Nations. Um, they completed the first work program in 2019, um, and they now have a continuing work program up to 2030 with a series of assessments and um, activities that are part of that. Uh, they have over 130 member state governments that form part of this intergovernmental um, structure that oversees all the activities and over 2000 experts have inv been involved to date. And IPBES forms uh, kind of the latest iteration of a long line of organizations that are often described as global environmental assessments. Uh, so these might be the um, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that came out in 2005. Uh, the IPCC, the sister, more famous sister body to IPBES, um, looking at climate change. And then, of course, IPBES produced its global assessment, its first global assessment uh, in 2019. So what do these organizations do? Um, perhaps they're most famous for synthesizing the state of knowledge uh, on environmental issues such as biodiversity, but also they're very important for authorizing that state of knowledge. And they do that through bringing governments into the process to scrutinize and design the processes through which knowledge is synthesized, but also by involving large communities of scientific experts from lots of different disciplines and parts of the world. So collectively they can authorize that knowledge. Um, and in doing so, 
they also define the knowledge gaps and mo motivate uh, what's called assessment science. So they're producing, they're, they're setting out um, areas of knowledge production um, and catalyzing the production of knowledge to support um, their ongoing assessment processes. Um, and in terms of the social sciences and humanities, we can think about these two functions as being about the contribution of content knowledge to these types of assessments. But also scholarship has found that global environmental assessments have a much broader range of functions that goes beyond just synthesizing and authorizing knowledge. Um, so one of these additional kind of effects or functions of global environmental assessments is also to construct the issue frames and policy discourses around which environmental issues are understood and also managed. So this means that global environmental assessments are what's termed performative of the environment. They create the environment that then is um, understood and managed through policy processes. And scholars have written about this, um, particularly around uh, the construction of global average temperature as a metric for thinking about climate change. Global environmental assessments also are important because they deliberate and define the standards um, through which science and policy relations take place at the global scale. <clears throat> um, and this happens both intentionally and by accident. Um, it happens whether or not it's intentional or, intentional, um, or whether or not it's just happening. Um, by the very act of creating these organizations, um, by the very act of producing outputs from them, um, these global environmental assessments uh, create routines, standards, and they normalize the ways in which science and policy are perceived to, to relate to one, to one another at the global scale. Um, and then finally, they have very human effects. So they build networks within and across science and policy communities, um, and they allow those communities to interact um, and form agreed sets of practices. Um, so in this sense, they create communities of practice. And there's been good research done about the ways in which the involvement of early career researchers within these organizations are kind of inducted into these communities of practice uh, to learn how to do assessment processes. So given these different functions or effects of global environmental assessments, what is the role of um, social sciences and humanities? So, um, well, a review back in 2018 um, identified three major contributions. The first of these being knowledge production. So simply the contribution of new knowledge and research that can be then synthesized by these organizations. Uh, the second is contextualization and framing which speaks more to the performativity of global environmental assessments and the role of social sciences and humanities in helping to construct uh, frames and to construct uh, ways of thinking about environmental issues that actually productively allow policy making to take place around them. And then third and finally, there's process design. Um, and this is not only the contribution to making global environmental assessments more effective, um, but it's also about thinking creatively about the concepts, instruments and methodologies um, that uh, can be used by science communities and policy communities and also facilitate their interaction. Um, and to contextualize these various contributions, um, I'd like to share with you a example of a quote uh, which um, I collected during my PhD research looking at IPBES when I was speaking to a, one of the administrators and asking them why the social sciences and humanities might be important. Um, and they said, well, you don't speak directly to the fish in the ocean. You need laws, you need regulations, and you need all the things that go between the people and the fish and affect the fate of that fish. Um, so in this sense, they're suggesting that social sciences and humanities are important for creating the full picture. Um, similar discussions have taken place in the IPCC, um, an editorial uh, on social sciences and humanities in the IPCC suggested that uh, the organization suffered from what they called the streetlight effect. Um, essentially that the reports were focusing on uh, a well-lit pool of the brightest climate science, but ignoring the insights that kind of sat out in the darkness um, from the social sciences and humanities. 
And it's interesting in this image, the ways in which the, the kind of climate scientists in the middle are uh, uh, singing in harmony while outside um, the things represented by the social sciences and humanities are uh, kind of warring are at war with one another. There's images of people kind of fighting um, and screaming um, and this sense that, you know, perhaps is it a good idea to bring these kind of warring things into the spotlight of a global environmental assessment? And these kinds of concerns played out um, more explicitly within IFBES um, in a editorial and a news article that was published in the journal Nature back in 2018. Um, which was called Battle Over the Soul of Biodiversity. Um, and this, uh, this news report essentially talked about growing rifts within the organization um, that were threatening the authority of the organization um, and that these rifts were playing out not only between the global so North and global South countries, but also between different knowledges such as indigenous perspectives, um, scientific perspectives, the humanities and the social sciences. Um, all of these kind of uh, con concerns are still in the mix and still to be decided uh, or still to be negotiated and kind of see where they go. Uh, but I think they're an important background for thinking about uh, the inclusion of social sciences in IFBES. So how does inclusion work in IFBES? Uh, a review done in 2019 uh, suggests that there are two major areas um, that we should look at when we're thinking about inclusion. The first of these being procedural dimensions. So questions such as who is involved, when and how are they involved, and how are these, how are they invited and selected? And um, those of you that know IFBES well will know that IFBES has very strict rules for how it selects its ex experts. Um, the majority of experts need to be nominated directly by member state governments. Um, and then a small proportion can also be nominated by other organizations. Um, and then there's rules around their selection and also once selected how they can kind of operate within the platform, what they can work on and what they can't work on. Uh, the review also identified a set of substantive dimensions for how we should think about inclusion. Um, and this refers to not only who's in the room, so who participates, but also what do the outputs look like that come from that participation? And to what extent do those outputs include uh, the diversity that's represented? Um, and the example that I've given here on this slide is a, is a segment of the IFBES conceptual framework where diversity is represented through the inclusion of scientific perspectives um, around human well-being alongside um, other perspectives such as living well in balance and harmony with Mother Earth. Uh, but scholars have thought critically about inclusion in IFBES, um, particularly around these two dimensions, um, and they've come up with, they've identified both challenges and also proposed solutions for how we might move forward. Um, scholarship has identified challenges in particular around the procedures for nomination and selection, um, and suggested particularly around social sciences and humanities that there might be challenges for governments who perhaps are not so experienced in interacting with um, environmental social sciences and environmental humanities um, to know who to actually go to to nominate experts when IFBES needs them. Uh, scholarship has also looked at the ways in which numerical representation, so the decision to kind of count who the number of experts from different categories that are put within is the expert groups of IFBES um, can actually miss what they've termed epistemic worldviews. Um, so this means that you might create categories such as sociologist, geographer, political scientist, and choose experts to participate based on those categories. But at the same time, you might also miss on the diversity of different ways in which these experts think about the world. So are we including enough positivist researchers? Are we including enough constructivist researchers and how do these different epistemologies kind of um, get counted and how do they shape the processes of IFBES. Um, scholarship has also looked at the formal rules and the informal norms within IFBES such as that of consensus um, and how this might facilitate or limit input from various scholars. Um, and then finally a need uh, to recognize 
instead of inclusion, we also need to pay attention to effective participation to make sure that those people that are included are not just there to make up the numbers, but they're actually time, given time and resources to, to make the contributions that they want to make. So to end my short presentation, I wanted to briefly talk about how we might think about going beyond numerical inclusion. Um, and I suggest we might do this today by thinking about IBEZ as an epistemic culture. Uh, so drawing on work of Noor Satina, um, which defines epistemic cultures as those sets of practices, arrangements, and mechanisms that are bound together by necessity, affinity, and historical coincidence, which in a given area of prof professional expertise make up how we know what we know. And importantly for thinking about IFBEZ, epistemic cultures not only include social relations, but they also include and take account of the material objects and the material resources that are made available for the production of knowledge. So from this perspective, we can ask, how is the epistemic culture of IFBEZ made and who gets to create and change it? And in a paper that um, I've recently submitted for peer review, um, I've tried to look at IFBEZ as an epistemic culture um, by following the work of the experts on scenarios and models that took place during the first work program. And I think this is a really good example, um, perhaps to, to follow for social sciences and humanities, because from the beginning, scenarios and models were backed by a technical support unit. They had that institutional and um, uh, administrative backing to, to make sure that they were given the time and resources that they needed to do their work. They were championed from within the MEP and the Bureau. Um, and this allowed them to be commit to have a methodological assessment on scenarios and models commissioned as one of the first outputs uh, from the platform. And within this methodological assessment, um, over 80 authors came together um, over a two year period to, to discuss uh, debate, deliberate, and write about uh, first best practices for how models and scenarios and models could develop into the future, but also set out recommendations for IFBEZ on how it could take scenarios and models further into its work program, and also how science and policy communities might also work better with scenarios and models to support um, policy making around biodiversity. And by having this methodological assessment, it gave them the material resource uh, to, to justify the creation of an ongoing expert group that actually was embedded within it, had the had funding and an annual budget to work with. Um, and that expert group was able to work with the other assessment processes, the regional assessment, the global assessment, to, um, to help them use scenarios and models in their assessments. Um, but they also were able to catalyze um, uh, and describe an external research agenda. So a set of kind of broad questions and needs that would allow, um, allow IFBEZ to kind of better use scenarios and models. Um, and within, uh, I think it was within a year of the methodological assessment being published, they were able to, um, to uh, kind of facilitate or kind of catalyze the release of I think it was around 28 million euros um, to support external research activity uh, that would feed into the IFBEZ process. Um, and then finally, they now have a task force going forward in the continuing work program. So how might we think about this example and take it uh, apply it to social sciences and humanities within IFBEZ and think about how it might allow them to forge a form of epistemic belonging within IFBEZ itself. Um, and I'm suggesting epi epistemic belonging means to have the access and control of social and material resources through which participating experts can assert their importance, define their specialist skills and enact their own specialized practices. Um, and this, I should mention, given that Rolf uh, Liscott is on the call, that epistemic belonging kind of sits alongside and, and complements a concept that he's worked on called group, uh, group belonging um, and written about the ways in which group belonging matters within the IFBEZ process as well. Um, 
so uh, in practice for social sciences and humanities, this may mean that it does need a technical support unit, um, that maybe there are is a need for more methodological assessments, perhaps a task force, or perhaps some other form of kind of institutional uh, structure that can support its inclusion. Um, but ultimately, it means uh, different, the diversity of perspectives within social sciences and humanities somehow need to get attain the power and resources both to de define and enact their own contributions to the process. Uh, so just to conclude, um, there are already a range of practical actions to be taken to support inclusion of social sciences and humanities. Um, and this will require a recognition that global environmental assessments have a broader role beyond just knowledge synthesis. And actually they might have responsibility to, to kind of foster and facilitate uh, the work of diverse knowledge communities. Um, and then finally, that the ability for social sciences and humanities to shape the epistemic culture of IFES is as important as their contribution to content knowledge within the reports themselves. And then I'll just finish by sharing uh, some of the references that I mentioned in my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Jasper, for this uh, really interesting uh, presentation. 